Hi, my name is Alessia Kripa, and I work in SIVA, and I'm pleased to welcome you at the first ECZ round. Before to introduce our speaker, let me explain briefly that we will have a Q&A session after the round, and you can post your questions both on Q&A on BlueJeans platform and on Facebook streaming. I'm very happy to introduce you Roberto Santilli. Professor Roberto Santilli graduated from the College of Veterinary Medicine of the University of Milan, became a diplomat of the European College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, Companion Animals in Specialty of Cardiology, of course, and then between 24 and 26, he completed a master in electrophysiology and electrical stimulation at the University of Medicine of Insubria. He then obtained a PhD at the University of Turin in 2010. Roberto Santilli is the head of the cardiology departments of the Clinica Veterinaria Malpensa Nicura in Samarate, close to Varese, and of the hospital Portoni Rossi, always a Nicura group, close to Bologna. Since 2014, he has been an adjunct professor of cardiology at the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine, where he is actively involved in the activities of the Cardiac Electrophysiologic Laboratory. He is, of, co of course, a co-author of the book, Electrocardiography of the Dog and the Cat, now translated into seven languages. His main research activities include the diagnosis and the treatment of arrhythmias in dog and cats. Thanks, Roberto, to accept to speak this evening, and not only, this is only the, B, the first one of a six monthly appointment, and I let you the stage. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you, Alessia. Welcome, everybody. So this is our first ECG round. As you heard, it's going to be a series of six of them. Tonight, we will talk mainly about junctional rhythms and junctional tachycardia. So let's start with the clinical cases, then we can move into the ECG finding. And then again, if you have any question, any comments, anything you want to ask me, you can just write in the Q&A of the BlueJeans platform or, or in the, on the Facebook uh, uh, page. So this is a, an, a dog, a male, eight years old, an American staff for child. He has a history of uh, cardiac murmur since, he, since birth. And he had in the last period of time two transient loss of consciousness, particularly after exercise. And in, in the last days, in the last two days, he had some more frequent TLOX, so transient loss of consciousness, with weakness and anorexia. So this is the physical exam. So it was a, a normal dog for the body condition score. He had pale mucous membrane. He has a hypothermia. And again, the murmur was best heard on the left apical systolic uh, area. He has a very rapid respiratory rate with a uh, low normal uh, for the situation heart rate. Then he has a weak femoral pores with cold body extremities. So our plan was to do a chest X-ray and a, a rapid ECG and, and then a fast echocardiography. And as you can see from the chest X-ray, we see some cardiomegaly uh, with some uh, what we believe is a uh, uh, pulmonary edema and with also venous congestion, as you can see here from both views. And this was the ECG. So let's start. So usually, as you know, we do the 12 lead ECG. We like to have uh, all of them simultaneously. And as you can see for this dog, they, we suspect that this dog is in shock because he has all clinical sign uh, characteristic of shocks, but uh, he has a, a kind of low normal ventricular rate. So you can see there are QRS complex that looks normal to me. So if you look, there is a Q and an R and is normal axis on the frontal plane. 
and a normal axis on the horizontal plane. Remember V1 in the first right intercostal space, and it looks normal with a tiny R and a deep S, and then you have a normal positive from V2 to V6 that are reading the left ventricle. So this is reading the right ventricle. But then what we see, we cannot see a very discrete P wave. We have something here, but we believe it's an artifact. It's a motion artifact because it's a very tiny waves and it is not repeatable. But then if you look carefully, just after the QRS complex, you can see some positive wave. They are moving. You see there is one here, then it's go into it. And if you have any doubt regarding, you can go down here. And that's why we, we really like to do precordial because you can see there is a positive P waves here. And then if you go up here, this is the positive one. And then you see that the P wave is going into previous QRS complex here. And you see here is even closer. So our diagnosis here is a junctional rhythm with uh, isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation because the ventricle is depolarized through the his bundle while the atria is depolarized from the sinus node. So this is our uh, these are sinus P wave. And so we say that is this is dissociated because you see the R P is variable. So P is moving into the QRS complex. This is usually due to the effect on the baroreceptor reflex, because you can imagine when you have a QRS complex with the P wave that are simultaneous, what happens is that you have an atrial contraction against closed uh, atrioventricular valve, and this will induce a drop in the uh, stroke volume. And that's so, that's why usually then the P wave is moving backward. But what is also interesting here, we are around 60. A bit per minute. What is interesting is that also the P wave here is very slow. So it's kind of synchronized, what we call type uh, one synchronization. So the P wave is moving back and forth across the QRS complex. But what is interesting here that the P wave on the sinus rate is very low. So if we have a dog with cardiogenic shock but we have a not sinus tachycardia that is usually compensatory. We have actually sinus bradycardia together with the slow junctional rhythm. And here, let's see what happened. So suddenly this is the, the, the junctional rate again with the rhythm with the P sinus P wave that is moving. And then suddenly the heart rate arise a little bit. And so you can see now that there is a P and QRS complex, it looks associated. So we move from a junctional rhythm with isorhythmic AV dissociation into a sinus rhythm. But look carefully what happened when we move from here to here. And you can actually see the, the sinus P wave that was dissociated here, and now it comes before the QRS complex, and now is associated. And he has the same morphology of this one here. But now look what happened in the precordial. So during the junctional rhythm, we have a, this type of QRS complex morphology, but look what happened when it goes into a sudden change of the rate. So here we have the ventricle depolarized by the His, and the, and the atria is depolarized randomly, but just uh, synchron dissociated from the ventricle. And here everything becomes associated. And look what happened. This, is, we can call it, it is a notch. So it's a QRS complex with a notch that is little bit here, but it's not as visible as is in this part of the tracing. I think this is a, an interesting finding. We will discuss a little bit in a minute what this can be. So when we have this notch in the QRS complex, what we can consider? So myocardial conduction abnormalities that can be either due 
to uh, presence of fibrosis with alteration of the conduction or can just be aberrancies. So there is just a change in the conduction due to a change of the rate. So some minor form of intraventricular uh, conduction abnormality is not about, it's not the aberrancy that we usually think about. So due to banda branch block, this is a type of aberrancy that is directly into the myocardium. That's why you got this type of notch. And these are all the different alteration of the QRS complex that you have to consider. So we are talking about notch. Here, for example, is here. Then we had a notch just as our, in our example is just after. So it's called notch R wave. Then you have what we call splintered QRS complex with this type of morphology. You can have notch S wave, but this is what we very rarely we can find. This is called fragmented QRS complex. And this is this is is very unlikely that this type of complex is due to uh, conduction disturbances or aberrancy is mainly due to severe fibrosis within the myocardium with change of the velocity of conduction. And it's important when you do ECG, you know that you use the exact filtering because sometimes if you use different low pass filter, you see here, you don't see the fragmentation that you actually see here. So we like to do 150 for cat and 70 for dog. Be careful to change the low pass filter when you want to study the QRS complex, particularly for this type of alteration. So other type of alteration of the QRS complex that is also called QRS complex larring. This is due to the presence of fragmentation of the conduction. This is an, uh, in, in, a type of ECG that is rarely due in veterinary medicine. So it's the high definition ECG. But look what, what, what happened in the QRS complex when you have this alteration of the conduction, not in the branches. This is an alteration of conduction within the myocardium. And as you can see here, there is a slurry. So a, slowing of the down slope of the QRS complex and it become more and more uh, prolonged when this fragmentation of the conduction is, uh, is present. So most of the time when you have cardiomyopathy, you don't see notch, you just see slurring or you can see very rarely the real fragmentation that I showed you in the slide before. And there is a paper that is looking about the, the, the QRS complex duration, and they found a difference in survival. So if it's a survival, um, the QRS complex is more than 60, there is a half time of survival. And then there is another paper about the notch on the QRS complex, just like ours. Usually this is fixed, but in, in our case, this was just due to the aberrancy uh, related to the, the sudden change in the rate and the presence of normal AV conduction after a slow junctional rhythm. And they found that the purple is when it's present a lot, usually with systolic dysfunction because there is a lot of fibrosis. And if you say yes or no, obviously if there is cardiac disease. So when you see a notch, is always an under, a sign, an ECG sign that you have alteration of fibrosis. So you can find mainly the slurring, but in severe fibrosis, you can find notch or even better if you find uh, the fragmentation. And uh, be careful not to confound the uh, notch with the presence of J-wave. So J-wave, remember, is the early repolarization. So it's just at the end of the phase zero of the action potential. You have the tiny in dogs, very commonly you find this type of positive wave that is called J-wave. And if you use the right filtering, usually you can see it. In a normal situation, you don't. And this is a paper that show that a lot of breeds can have J-wave. And you see most of the breeds can have J-wave. And this is a completely normal finding for dogs.
This is the splintered, uh, splintered QRS complex, usually has been associated with alteration of the intraventricular septum, particularly associated, uh, as you see from this very, very old paper, with the presence of uh, tricuspid valve dysplasia. And finally, remember the fragmented narrow QRS complex or the fragmented wide QRS complex. And this is what we see. You see, you must see more than one uh, uh, change. For example, this is a fragmentation of the S wave, but you see there is a lot of uh, spike. And this is not very common. Well, when you find it, this is particularly important because it's a sign of severe, severe uh, fibrosis of the myocardium. So why we have fragmentation? So it's a type of conduction in the myocardium with a lot of scars. Scar due to fibrosis, inflammation, fibrofatty for, for ARVC and so on. And so when you see uh, is a fragmentation, uh, this is usually a sign of underlying cardiomyopathy. This is also true for uh, notch R wave or also for um, the presence of different cardiomyopathy when you also have fragmentation, notch or slurry. So this, let, let's go back to our case. So you see there is a severe mitral valve dysplasia, severe left atrial dilation, severe left ventricular dilation. And again, this dog with really, really hypoxia, and that's, we, probably that's induced uh, the uh, cardiogenic shock. This is the mitral valve. You see there is short cardiac tendine, presence of regurgitation. And there is a very, very high feeling pressure with a, a, the presence of mitral valve regurgitation, as you can see here. So our diagnosis, mitral valve dysplasia with the left ventricular, sorry, sorry atrioventricular remodeling due to uh, volume overload. Acute alveolar pulmonary edema with cardiogenic shock. And what we we consider the presence of acquired sinus node dysfunction together with this junctional escape rhythm that we saw. And so we use furosemide, pimobendin, and then we, uh, the, this is a, in the CRI, as you can see here, to solve the pulmonary edema. And then we start the butamine, try to uh, balance the presence of uh, bradycardia, hypoxia, and the presence of uh, sh cardiogenic shock. At admission uh, and, and 12 post uh, treatment, as you can see, there is a major um, resolution of the pulmonary edema, and the dog was actually better. And see here on the DV view. This is pre and post. As you can see, the contractility, obviously the, the volume looks better, but uh, obviously because there is also an increase in the rate and also the contractility did increase due to the, the use of the butyl. At admission, again, very, very high feeling pressure, and this is just after treatment, they were a little bit decreased. This is the 3D of the mitral valve dysplasia, so with all the leaflet that present alteration of the structure. So let's go back to our ECG again. We had this ECG with junctional rhythm and this high and this the presence of bradycardia with isorhythmic AV, uh, uh, isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation. And this is 12 hour post. Look what happened here now. If the rate get better, the P wave, you see you have a bifid P wave. So also in the atria, there is a change in the conduction uh, despite the use of the view. I mean, the atria is really remodeled. And so there is a slow conduction that induces an increase in the activation. Uh, time. But look what happened after a longer pause. Here now you have a normal looking P wave. So how this can be? So we never think that when the atrial activation 
during tachycardia, most of the time in disease are go along the posterior or left atrial wall. And that's where you have non-uniform anisotropic conduction. That's probably why you have this type of P wave. And then suddenly, when the rate gets longer uh, and, and slower, sorry, it goes anteriorly, so that the area of the left atrium anteriorly is more rapid in the conduction. So this can be an option, and you can actually see quite well here the bifid P wave here, posterior activation of the atria, particularly of the left atrium, slow and uh, induce this low activation. That's why you got the left atrium here. And then it's much better, so you don't see the left atrial activation when it's going, the, uh, the activation of the atria uh, with a slower rate going anteriorly, so where it's faster. And this is what usually happens when you have the activation of the atria. So the interatrial conduction over the posterior connection is very, very slow. And that's why you have this type of activation. But sometimes when you have also the Bandelbrand, sorry, the Bachmann bundle block, it can actually become negative in the last part, because is, is the activation at the end starts from left, they go back to right, but this is very, very rare, either in human, and, and I, haven't, I haven't seen yet a case in dog. But here, after the longer pause, the P wave get better again, because there is a conduction along the anterior left atrial wall. So then we, what we did, so we uh, discharged the dog and we used a torsemide, hemobendin, uh, enalapril, and spironolactone. The dog was already on enalapril, otherwise, as you know, we can use combination of drugs uh, uh, and also other AC inhibitors, just like benazapril. I mean, there is no major difference. So let's talk now a little bit about this arrhythmia. So uh, usually the AV node is charging the dog from 40 to 60. This is, and usually be, below 60, we call it uh, escape junctional rhythm. From 60 to 100, roughly, we call it junctional rhythm. And if it's more than 100, and usually less than 180, we call it junctional tachycardia. So let's move now and try to uh, understand why this dog had this junctional escape rhythm so slow. So usually the, the sinus node respond quite uh, actually very, very bad to progressive hypoxia. And this is due to an effect, direct effect of hypoxia on the sinus node. And so for some patients, it's not common, but we found, just like this case, we also found other patients that present cardio deceleration when they have desaturation. And there is also some idea about the amount of desaturation needed. So the likely mechanism to explain this um, unique phenomenon is the effect of the hypoxia on the sinus node. And so there is a real electrophysiological effect on the sinus node. So there is a slowing directly due to hypoxia. And usually this is for human, probably it's gonna be the same for dog. Below 80 to 90, we see these acquired sinus node dysfunction due to the effect of hypoxia. As you saw, as soon as we treat the animal and we solve the edema, we obtain a control of the uh, junctional rhythm and also of the sinus bradycardium. This is another example uh, of an obstructive bronchopneumopathy in a, in a, in a cat. As you know, junctional rhythm are very, very rare in cats. Uh, I have, uh, also, sinus node dysfunction is very, very rare or also maybe absent in cats. And so if you look at this particular trace here, we see some P waves and a QRS complex with a change in the axis. So there is a left shift, uh, minus 30 from 20 to 30. There is a tiny Q wave in AVL. This is the change in the first vector because there is a left anterior fascicular block. 
So usually what you have to see is not just the presence of S wave in Q3 and AVF, but the presence of Q wave in AVL, because this is the, the first vector that changed direction. It's now the, the vector coming from left to right, the, activating the septum, when you have a simultaneous activation of the two left fascicle, but here you have just an activation from the posterior fascicle because the anterior is blocked, and this change, so there is a, a superior to inferior activation that produce a Q in ABL. And you see when the dog, this cat has a, a severe hypoxic problem, what happened, you have again, this acquire and just intermittent bradycardia with a junctional escape. But be careful because here, if you see this type of activation, and here looks that the QRS compass is changing, but it's not the QRS compass. This is the P overimposed on this negative, so the sinus P that is dissociated. Just like our dogs, also in this escape rhythm, we have a um, junctional escape rhythm with isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation. You can see the P that is moving back and forth across the QRS complex. And this is, again, another example of hypoxic induced bradycardia with junctional rhythm here and here. So let's move now to another case where you can have junctional rhythm. And I also, uh, took some ECG that some of you posted on our uh, canine and feline arrhythmia study group. So we know that sick sinus syndrome is when you have sinus node dysfunction with, with symptoms, so with uh, syncope and t lock and so on. And obviously the most common is uh, ion chain dysfunction, but you can also have some infiltrative form there are cases also with cardiomyopathy, and then there is fibrosis of the AV node. But since there is a familiar, since it's a familiar disease, particularly in Westy and miniature schnauzer, also in dog, there should be some ion channel dysfunction. But remember, you also have extrinsic factor inducing it. And so you have some of this autonomia, some vagal, uh, inappropriate vagal reflex, so vasovagal syncope, and again, we also have hypothermia, hypoxia, obstructive sleep apnea. We got a bunch of cases. We are pre preparing a, a case series about that, and particularly, in, you probably have read the paper about uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that they usually have alteration of the nose uh, inducing this obstructive sleep apnea. So this uh, kind of acquire is due to a string six factor. And then you have in most of the cases, sinus arrest with or without junctional escape. So it's very common to have it. So let's see a case, a particular case of sinus node dysfunction. As you can see here, there is a very long sinus pause up to nine seconds. So the idea is that you see there is negative P wave, P prime wave, so we call it P prime, and, and then another P prime is here, and then it's a start and stop with a junctional escape here. So let's look what happened before the sinus pose and after the sinus pose. So look what happened here. We have a negative P prime, negative in inferior lead, more positive in AVR compared to AVL, so it is not concentric. To be concentric, so starting from the junction, AVR and AVL should be exactly the same. So this is not the case. And, and so it's probably arising from the area of the coronary sinus since we have a flat lead one. So remember lead one, tell us if it's right or left. If it's left, it's negative in lead one. If it's right, it's either like here flat or isodiphasic. So this is a, a, a very commonly, there is an escape rhythm starting from the area of the coronary sinus ostium. And you know, you will discuss in a minute, this is an area where you have still the AV junction. Like it's an area with a very, very slow conduction. And that's why you have a long PQ 
long PQ with a form of bank back because then you have a shorter PQ and then suddenly there is a longer pull. So there is no sinus P wave, so it's a kind of sinus standstill with this escape coming from the junction, particularly the area of, of the right posterior right atrium. And then suddenly you have after the pause, there is this junctional uh, beat, and we will now look into this area here, then you have a sinus, and then again the escape from the coronary sinus area or the posterior junctional area. So let's look this this particular uh, beat, and we con can compare with this sinus beat. Be careful here. You see that the ST is flat here. If you go here, you see there is a negative here. So it's negative in two, three, and AVF, and equally positive in AVR and AVL. So it's coming exactly in the middle of the heart from the anterior junction, and so the axis is here, five, between minus 80 and minus 100, AVR and AVL are exactly the same amplitude and, and the same polarity. And here is, is the video showing you that it's coming from the junctional. When I say the anterior junctional is concentric, AVR and AVL equal, and then all the inferior lead negative. If it's eccentric from the coronary sign of the tear, Usually, AVR and AVL are not exactly the same. And this is uh, the anatomy of this area. So the coronary sinus is where we have the, this low pathway. Remember that also in dog, just like in human, there is a dual longitudinal dissociation of the AV node. So there is an anterior conduction very, very fast. It's the fast pathway along the Oramio Valley and the interatrial septum, and then there is a slow pathway down here, close to the coronary sinus. So in this dog, the area is, is when you have the uh, escape from the coronary sinus from the posterior, right posterior junctional area. And then suddenly when we got the, ju the junctional beat with the retroconduction was here, so it was from the area of the fast pathway, there was a retroconduction back in the atria. And be careful also in this other example of sinus node dysfunction, you have a P and QRS complex T, this is a sinus, then you have a junctional read, and look how nicely you can see the presence of the sinus, the presence of this junction, and here, tiny negative P prime wave in the ST segment. And if you look, are negative in inferior lead, 2, 3, and AVF, equally positive in AVR and AVL. This is a concentric retroactivation, and so is the, from the junction, so the, he's activated the ventricle, and simultaneously is going backwards along a not so fast because you see the distance between the QRS complex and the P prime is, is, is a little bit long, but the P has a concentric retroactivation. That means that it's still going along the fast pathway, so anteriorly along the interatrial septum. And it's a kind of long RP prime. And then here, there is another example where you see, if you compare very well here, you can see that there is a junctional escape, and these are the T wave, and then you see into the QRS complex, there is this tiny negative P prime wave, again, with a, a kind of long RP prime, but still concentric because AVR and AVL are equally positive. But what is important, B1, lead one should be almost flat. Here are some example of, of our colleague from, from Korea, and he posted on our um, uh, group of Facebook group, this is Sinus. Then suddenly you see there is a junctional escape and you see now there is 
In this bead, you can see a, 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 a isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation because the, the sinus P wave is moving back and forth across the curious complex. But what is very interesting, if you compare with the sinus here, you see that the, at the end of the curious complex, you have a pseudo S wave. So this is a P prime. This is the best P prime because this is anterior along the fast pathway. And when it's along the, fa the real fast pathway, the RP prime is very short. That's why we call it pseudo S wave. You see it's negative in inferior lead and equally positive in AVR and AVL and flat in lead one. So short RP prime, this is a classical uh, feature for a retrograde conduction along the, uh, in the HIS using the fast pathway going along the, in very rapid along the interatrial cell. And this is the other example. We have just three leads for this one, but still this is sinus. You can see there is a very nice uh, J wave. This is a, don't consider this a notch. It's just the J wave, it's a normal. But then compare this ST with this. You see, there is a negative P prime in the ST segment. A very, very positive here and uh, a flat here. So it's not a concentric retroactivation. So the, probably this is just, a, a, again, a junctional with a sinus that is moving dissociated, or can be some form of retroactivation arising from uh, an area uh, close to the posterior right atrium. And also look at this one here. So this is a nice sinus rhythm. The axis is deviated toward the right. As you can see, AVR is the more positive. There is the first and the second vector here in V1 that is reading the right ventricle. And then you have all the negative from V2 to V6 that is reading the left ventricle. So this is a complete right bound branch block. And suddenly you have a long pause. And here you have a tiny P negative in inferior lead Latin one, equally positive in AVR and AVL. So this is an example again of a junctional escape beat. In this case, the P is associated and is retroconductive. And it's different from, after the sinus pose, it's different from after what happened after the second sinus pose. Look at this curious complex. This is very wide. So our first differential that is ventricular, but then what happened is you look at the morphology is exactly the same. It's just wider, but the morphology is exactly of the beat conducted with the right bundle branch block. So remember that you can have different effect of the rate on the bundle. So here you got some complete right bundle branch block, but after a long pause, we have what we call Phase four aberrancy or bradycardia dependent aberrancy. And so the QRS complex is still a right bundle branch block, more block because it's after a long pause due to the aberrancy. Remember, aberrancy is not just on a normal QRS complex, can also be on a, a bundle branch block QRS complex, also on ventricular ectopic complex. So this is a phase four or bradycardia dependent appearance. So let's finish with junctional tachycardia. And remember during sinus rhythm, you have the sinus, uh, the atria are depolarized from the sinus node and then through the AV junction, there is the ventricle. When you have junctional tachycardia, they start here. And so the, the ventricle is activated usually from the junction that can be either be the atrial junction or the his that we will see there is the two different type and then the sinus node can be silent so you have retroactivation or can work and so you have isorhythmic AV dissociation. So these are the two tachycardia that we publish so the non-paroxysmal junctional tachycardia the focal junctional tachycardia. 
So this is another uh, ECG that I posted for you and I will discuss it a little bit on Facebook. I wanna discuss again with you here. So this is the non-parosisma junctional tachycardia. Look how nice you can see there is a very prolonged P and also is bifid. When you have prolonged and bifid, this is the posterior right atrium. Again, exactly as when you have a positive and bifid is the posterior left atrium, or this is the posterior right atrium. So close to the coronary sinus where you have a lot of non-uniform and isotropic conduction, you are very close to the heels. So the PQ is short. And be careful because when I posted, I ask you, do you think this is pre-excitation? So you can uh, do, read erroneously because it looks that you have a positive wave here. But remember, when you have a very prolonged P prime arising from the posterior right atrium close to the coronary sinus, so the floor of the right atrium, you have a big P sub A. So this, what you see is the T sub A going uh, um, on top of the QRS complex. So you have a negative arising from the coronary sign, short PQ, normal QRS complex. So this is arising from the posterior right atrium. And look carefully here, zoom, bifid, prolonged. What happened here, and now we will do a zoom about this. So you have negative and Y, negative and Y, negative and Y. And suddenly you see here, you have an area of uh, P prime that's still coming in this case from the anterior area, because you see it's concentric retroactivation, AVR and AVL are equally the same, the axis, from minus 80 and minus 100. And if we zoom this, let's see this one first. You see, this is the P prime here. This is the posterior AV junction, close, remember, to the coronary sinus osteum, P prime, T sub A. So be careful not to be confound that this is a delta wave. The P prime is 88 milliseconds. This is a very, very common feature for conduction along the posterior right atrium when it's negative in lead two or the posterior left atrium when it's positive in lead two. And then you have a P prime Q interval 102. If we look at this one, this is the P prime and this is the anterior area because now the P prime is 53 milliseconds, so it's faster. And if we measure DPQ, is actually shorter. So be careful when you measure PQ, be careful because this is the anterior area. So the PQ is faster, but the P, the activation of the atria when it starts anteriorly is faster, when it starts posteriorly is lower. And here you have the comparison between the posterior and the anterior. And this is the same for all junctional rhythm. If the P is usually negative, or is, as you can in a minute, it can be sinus and dissociated. And we already saw it. So the difference is the PQ shorter and the P prime shorter. So this is how you can do the differentials. So what changed, there are two ectopic foci, foci that are firing and the difference is related to the prolongation of the conduction in the, post, in the right posterior atrium. It's not the AV junction, it's the atria that change. And then when it's activated anteriorly, just like here, you see at this point that the PQ get faster because also you have a faster activation along the fast pathway. And again, fast pathway anteriorly interatrial septum, low pathway posteriorly close to the coronary sinus osteum. Here you have prolonged bifid P wave, here you have short and fast P prime wave.
Remember, somebody asked me, why is not a wandering pacemaker? That actually was a very good point because you, you, we got some sudden change in the, uh, in the P prime from positive to negative. But with wandering pacemaker, the, the, what happened is a change of the P according to the respiration most of the time, or but at least a change in the heart rate. So faster, superior exit, close to the cranial vena cava, and so you got spiky P wave because our, the vector of activation is parallel to lead two. When it's coming from the inferior, so close to the caudal vena cava, this is the high vagal tone, the P are actually, you see, less tall because are uh, perpendicular to lead to. But when you have, and this is the classical uh, sinus node wandering pacemaker, then you have the, the sinus node to the AV junction. But also in this case, you still have change of the P. It's not a sudden change. It's, it's getting slower, change the P, and then shift to a negative. Here, nice from the anterior and the fast pathway, look how spiky is the P. It's not coming from the posterior right atrium where it's very prolonged and slow. Then the last one is focal junctional tachycardia. We know that we discussed it a lot in our group. So we published back in 2012, the, AV, the isorhythmic AV dissociation in Labrador Retriever. So you have this type of junctional rhythm where then suddenly the P, the sinus P wave is coming back and forth. So isorhythmic AV dissociation, this, the atria are activated by the sinus P wave. The QRS complex is, is coming from the junction, from the his. And so the P, the sinus P wave and the QRS complex are dissociated with a similar rate. And, and this is called synchronization type one because it's moving back and forth according to the baroreceptor reflex. And then we have synchronization type two when the P is also called accrochage, when the P is always before the QRS complex. Remember, and we will discuss in a second, is the P that is actually pulling the QRS complex at the same rate. So there is a synchronization type two because it's the, the sinus node that is actually increasing the rate of the junction and it's getting very close. But if you move along, you see somewhere, you see some change in the PQ interval. You see that this P is a little bit more into the QRS complex. So be careful not to confound this with uh, uh, pre-excitation because you have the Q wave, so there is no possibility in a dog with a normal septal activation that you have a pre-excitation, and also because the P is still dissociated but synchronized type 2. And here the zoom, you see that this P is a bit more left-sided, this a little bit more right-sided, it is going into the QRS complex. So isorhythmic AV dissociation with synchronization type two. So this, the synchronization between atrial and ventricle depend on different factors, electrical and mechanical. What is important, and again, I told you that the sinus node has this boost up effect on the nodal pacemaker cell. So it's, it's actually uh, pulling and increasing the rate, trying to get it at the same rate. Then in the synchronization type one, the baroreceptor reflect change the position of the P, but in synchronization type two, there is this boost up effect. The synchronization remain constant and when the rate do not differ more than 10% from the average heart rate. When it's more, then you start having synchronization type one. So this is a, a, another example here where you have what happened during focal junction of tachycardia when the sinus rate drop, you have what we call focal junction of tachycardia with one-to-one -one VA retroconduction. And if we zoom here, you see this P prime here, just like in a pseudo S wave, equally positive in AVR and AVL, negative in two, three, and AVF, and flat in one. 
So this is going backwards. So the his is activating the ventricle and simultaneously is going backwards to the atria along the fast pathway. Tiny p concentric retroactivation because AVR and AVL are equal and with the same amplitude. And this, the axis is between minus 80 and minus 100. So focal junctional tachycardia with one-to-one -one VA, ventriculo atria, concentric retroactivation. All right, so this was our first ECG round. I invite you for our second one, so just schedule it if you like, if you enjoyed the first one. Uh, this is in the, um, gonna be the 1st of July. A, at, at the same 7 p.m. Uh, Italy time. And we will talk a little bit more on atrial fibrillation, new insights. So we will talk on all different atrial fibrillation. We'll talk how differentiate long standing from non long standing, uh, vagal atrial fibrillation, and so on. So, and then starting from the third one, if you have a particularly uh, interesting topic that we want to discuss with us, you can just write on, on our Facebook page or on my Instagram and we can prepare some. Maybe I will put a, a pool on, on Instagram so you can decide the round three, what, what topic you want to discuss with us. These are my contacts, so most of you know, the one that you are not already Register on our canine and feline arrhythmia study group. Now we are almost 800 cardiologists. And it's a very active group. And we are discussing ECG and a lot of, of colleagues are doing very, very nice diagnosis. And, and then if you are not yet registered to my Instagram page, I suggest to do it because here we do also some online education. We do live journal club where we have our new, new paper coming out. So if you want to stay updated, you can register on our Instagram page. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm happy to entertain any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Roberto. If uh, you can have a look on the backstage chat, I post for you a question uh, came from uh, uh, Facebook. So uh, I think that the colleague from Taiwan refer to the uh, 12 hours uh, uh, track uh, that you show for the clinical case. Task uh, can we call uh, a, a AVF uh, fragmented? Okay, so when you have at least three waves uh, on the R wave or on the S wave, yes. But if there is just a change like this, so you got R, S, R, this is, is more a kind of, can, can be more considered notch R wave or notch S wave. So to be considered fragmented, the, the oscillation should be on the same wave. Okay. And uh, always the same colleague uh, say that uh, missed the part when P will be in front of Q, R, S, and when after the for junction rhythm. Okay, so the, the P, when it's positive and is moving back and forth across the QRS complex or is just a, before the QRS complex, so you have to consider that there is the presence of isorhythmic atrioventricular dissociation. This is usually sinus P wave. When is negative in the inferior lead, and is before or after, you have to decide if it's coming from the anterior or, or the fast pathway or the posterior or the slow pathway. In such a case, so if it's anterior, the P wave is usually short in duration and if it, and with a concentric axis. So AVR and AVL are equally uh, in amplitude. If it's coming from the posterior right atrium, then it's bifid, very prolonged, and, and usually the, if it's before the PQ, it's, a, it's shorter, but the P prime is very, very long. And if it's after the QRS complex, usually the RP prime is longer, and for, for if it's coming from the posterior right atrium, and the RP prime is shorter if it's coming from the anterior right atrium. Okay, perfect. 
Another question is how can we distinguish a junctional escape bit originating from the floor of the right atrium or from the floor of left, uh, left atrium, sorry. Okay, I apologize that I saw that it's from Korea, it is actually from Taiwan, sorry for that, yeah, I, I should I should have remembered. And, okay, yeah, uh, it, it's a good question because you can have escape from also the the posterior left atrium. And in, in both cases, the P prime is prolonged and bifid, and it's negative in 2, 3, and ABF. So again, what will tell you right or left is lead one. So if it lead one is flat or positive or biphasic, usually this is coming from the right floor of the right atrium. If lead one is negative, it's coming from the floor of the left atrium. Okay, again, uh, Ang uh, uh, is asking, uh, do we still uh, see Hay wave in transmitral flow spectral Doppler with junctional rhythm? Absolutely, yes. And it depends on the position, obviously. If it's very, very close to uh, the either before or after, usually you have uh, some fusion between A and, and E. Uh, but if it, oh, sorry, E and A, but if it's uh, uh, on top of the QRS compress, you cannot see it. But most of the time, either if it's coming from the right posterior or from the right anterior, it's usually uh, visible and you can see the difference between E and A. Okay, perfect. Other two questions. The first is, uh, is non-paroxysmal junctional tachycardia common feature of digitals, digitalis sorry, toxicity in dog and cat? Yeah, this is a good point. Uh, as being shown for humans, yes. I have not the same experience for cat. Most of the cases that we see is the one that I show you in this presentation. So either dog with sinus node dysfunction or dog with hypoxic sinus node dysfunction, just like the case that I presented here, or uh, you can just have junctional tachycardia. So in, for junctional tachycardia, there are some particular breeds, just like Labrador in particular, that are very, very commonly affected. From junctional, you, most of the cases are sinus node dysfunction, either acquired or uh, you know, due to intrinsic or extrinsic factor. But I cannot remember a particular case related to digitalis. Can happen, but is I don't think it's 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 yeah, consider um, the most common cause. Okay, perfect. Uh, in the Q and A session, uh, there is just a question on the arm stuff uh, with the exercise intolerance and mitral valve dysplasia that uh, you showed at the beginning. Thomas is not. Uh, uh, sure uh, to understand well if you said eight years or uh, uh, eight months old was the dog was actually was actually eight years uh, and and the mitral valve dysplasia in some dog can remain silent for a while and most of the time uh, there is cases where particularly in uh, in bull terrier dogs you can actually have some uh, mitral valve dysplasia that stay for a long time with no symptoms and then suddenly they come with pulmonary edema. And usually it's a severe pulmonary edema. That's why it's really hypoxic because it's a, usually, this is another important comment, usually in, in mitral valve disease due to uh, degeneration of, you know, myxomatous degeneration is a chronic onset. So there are a lot of uh, compensatory factor working. For this dog, it's more uh, acute onset, and that's why they become epoxy, severely epoxy uh, in uh, very, very suddenly. Okay. Perfect, and always Thomas is asking if uh, with this diagnosis, the with proper medication, what is the life length on the expectation, the life expectation, I think? Sorry, can, can you say it again? I, I miss you for a few yes. words. Yes, uh, always referred to the same cases 
that you show with the, with the ANSTAF, uh, with the, this type of diagnosis and the, with an appropriate medication, what is the uh, life uh, length or uh, uh, expectation? Uh, since they remain uh, a lot of year, most of the cases has some year without clinical sign and then suddenly they decompensate. Usually when we see them, they are very, very advanced disease. And, and so that's probably why this, this uh, as soon as you start treating this animal is a very late uh, di disease and they don't have a very, very long survival. So I would rather say less than one year. Okay, Roberto, if you agree, we have the last question from Annette. Okay. What treatment would you give for congestive heart failure, mitral valve uh, disease when they are refractory to furosemide? I think that is very, very interesting okay. to answer it. Okay, as you know, in particularly in advanced congestive heart disease, uh, we, we like to, to, to use uh, in what we consider for mitral valve, obviously for acquired mitral valve disease, we consider class D. Uh, we really like to shift from furosemide to torsemide. And we have several cases now long-term treated with torsemide. And in most of the cases in class D uh, is used either once a day, but better twice a day. Uh, but now we are also in, uh, in class C, we are using torsemide uh, with a once a day uh, treatment. And in also in these cases, uh, is we, you can control long term uh, without major alteration of the kidney function. So, uh, and if it's not enough uh, in class D, then we increase pimobendin, we uh, use amlodipine, but there, there is a period where when you reach the amount of furosemide, if you are using this in class C and, and then you move to class D and then you have to, to shift to torsemide. Most of the time it works for, a, for long term. And obviously pyronolactone now, as you know, is recommended for class C already. So for class D, I didn't say that we add it, but in case this dog is not getting uh, uh, spironolactone, we usually add spironolactone at this point. Okay, if you have time, there is uh, just a question on uh, the association of the Nazipril and spironolactone. I don't know if Thomas uh, or which class is referred to, but uh, he's uh, asking uh, if you prefer to use uh, in, com in combination or separately for a better titration. Benazepril and spironolactone. As I mean. you know now, as I already said, there is a, in, already in class C now, uh, there is the, the use of uh, ACE inhibitor together with uh, spironolactone. So we use that. And obviously the, the combo drug can be used because there is for, for the owner, there is less drug to, to you know, to, to use separately. And, and um, I mean, most people sometimes have the idea that uh, we should use also benazepril twice a day. And, and I mean, some people say yes, some people say that you can just use once. Uh, but in, in combo, we, we like to use together, and, and I don't see any, you know, uh, major difference if you if you use together other than you separate. So we like to use also together. Okay, Roberto, thank you very much. I think we solved all the questions, but uh, if some attendees, uh, as you told, uh, as some other can write uh, on the group, on the Facebook page. And uh, I would uh, remember again that uh, we will have the second events, the, the second ECG, ECG round on the uh, July 1st at the same time. And uh, you have the registration link or you can follow on the Facebook page as uh, you did uh, this evening. Thanks a lot, Roberto. Thank you. See you, you next time, and thanks Thank everybody and my colleague Bye -bye. from SIVA from participation. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.